Welcome to Positive Disintegration, a path to authenticity. Today we're joined by guest Sally Trepanier, and we're going to talk about supporting each other within the gifted community, directly through friendships, through listening, sharing and being vulnerable, by helping teachers understand giftedness as it extends beyond achievement, and even bridging gaps between academics and those with lived experience. We're going to talk about the importance of listening, holding space, and recognising difference without crushing it. This episode, to paraphrase our guest, is all about helping each other and pulling each other through the muck of giftedness. G'day beautiful people, welcome back to another episode of Positive Disintegration. I'm your host Emma Nicholson and with me is co-host Dr. Chris Wells. Hi Chris. Hi Emma, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm excited to talk with my friend on our episode today. We've got a bit of a different feel today I think, is the, the right word for it. Yeah, that's right. This is an episode that'll have kind of a different kind of a different format, a different perspective, a little more casual maybe than we usually are. I guess we'll find out. That suits me. I like, you know me, I like things casual. So for our listeners, our guest today is Celia Trepanier. Celia is the author of Educating Your Gifted Child, How One Public School Teacher Embraced Homeschooling. She writes for her popular website, Crushing Tall Poppies, and serves on the G Word Film Advisory Board. Welcome to the podcast, Celia. Thank you, Emma. I am very excited to be here. I'm happy to meet you, and I'm so happy to speak with Chris. Yeah, welcome, Celie. We're so happy to have you. I'm going to just, you know, explain a little bit about how we know each other, and that's kind of the topic that I want to talk about for our first, well, who knows how many minutes. But we met in early 2015, And the reason why I was excited to have you come on the podcast is because I've been wanting to find ways to share more about my story in some ways, because, you know, I get a lot of feedback from people who can really relate to, to me and what I talk about on the podcast. And I know that Emma also gets a lot of feedback from people that they can relate to her and her story. And I thought, well, I think it would be cool to have somebody come on and you know, who kind of knew me when I was at the very beginning of this journey, because you did, you're one of the few people, you and Jen Merrill are really the two people who I connected with first in the gifted community. So it was 2015. And I was like, both trying to figure things out for myself, like my own gifted or twice exceptional journey. And I was also trying to figure things out for my son. And so that's what brought me to your site, Crushing Tall Poppies. And I remember that we also kind of met on Twitter, which is funny to me now because it's, I mean, it's not easy to like actually strike up a friendship with somebody on Twitter, (laughs) but that's how we met. And, you know, I was reading your blog and I was really just trying to, to figure things out for lack of a better way to put it. And so I remember writing you like these long emails and just probably asking you questions that you didn't know the answer to and... (laughs) Um, oversharing on stuff and, you know, and, and needing help because I just was, I mean, it was really intense to like discover the gifted community, to discover Dabrowski's theory and to just be trying to like make sense of it all. Do you like, do you remember those early days of getting to know me? Yes, I do. I remember, I don't recall exactly on Twitter, but I do remember the long emails. And where I was at that time was I was still looking for support and help. And I considered myself in need of support and help and knowledge. And I remember thinking, wait, she needs something from me. And it's like, no, I don't know anything. (laughs) I'm still in the boat where I need something. But um, my experience up to that point with the gifted community was that everyone was always willing to pay it forward. They were always willing to to help in any way they can. And so I thought, well, 
that's what I need to do too and share what I know up to that point. So um, I read your emails and, and I responded. You did. You were so kind. Oh my gosh. And so, yeah, I mean, I remember your book. Well, and again, this is how I got to, I mean, this is how I was like introduced to you and Jen Merrill. So, I mean, I read your book, Educating Your Gifted Child, because it was about homeschooling gifted kids. And I was homeschooling Jack by that point. And then Jen Merrill's book, If This is a Gift, Can I Send It Back? Um, you know, it was about twice exceptional kids. And she was a homeschool parent too. And so both of your books just gave me insights that I was looking for, helped me feel like a bit less alone in the parenting journey. And I was just excited to connect with other adults who had children who, you know, were somewhat like mine. But I think that what was so intense for me is that I was also trying to figure out my own personal gifted journey too. It was a lot. And that's so thank what, you for being so kind. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, in your emails, I could see where we were in the same, you know, need of, of where are we going? What are we doing? What is this? How can I not help? Because I think that's the most beautiful thing about the gifted community is the help that we all give each other. So, yeah, it was, I, you know, it it, it was a um, an exploratory time, I guess, but um, it's hard to put into words how it all started and, um, you, you know, your emails and the information you shared and uh, wanting to help, but not certain that I had anything to offer other than uh, listening. And, but, and it just went from there. It did. I mean, so one thing that really sticks out for me is that, so the first summer after I was getting to know you, um, I went to the Seng for the first time. For our listeners, Seng stands for Supporting the Emotional Needs of the Gifted. And the conference was in Denver that year. And so I decided to go. And I remember <laughs> I remember sitting in the parking lot and writing you like a panicked email because I just was so nervous about even going in. And I just, I mean, I was having like a panic attack in my car and I wrote to you and just shared like my nervousness and I was extremely just anxious. It, and I think it's because I was going through, you know, it was like totally a disintegration for me that I was going through, you know, during that time. I, I had done like an autoethnography the year before. And so um, the autoethnography had illuminated all of these things in my life and kind of forced me to work through a lot of my traumas. And by the time I met you, you know, I had gone through that stuff. And what it meant is that I was like rethinking so much about me and what was going on with me, you know, because I saw myself as mentally ill at the time. And this is something that I have to bring in now because that's why I was so nervous and having like a panic attack in the parking lot at Sang. And that's why I was reaching out to you because I was like, uh, like I'm mentally ill. I mean, I'm, are these people going to take me seriously? Um, you know, it was a real crisis because that's, I mean, I saw myself as a sick, you know, for so many years that I was still struggling with that. And it was just such a relief to have somebody supportive, you know, that was helpful. And I went in to saying, and the first person I walked up to was Jen Merrill because she was at the GHF booth, you know, in the exhibit area. And so I knew of her because of Twitter and her book. And so I went up and said hello to her. And, you know, the conference turned out to be fine. It was all great. Like, the the gifted community is very warm and welcoming. And so it's not like anything needed to be scary. It was only scary because of, of my own fears and insecurities at the time. It was an email. I couldn't remember if we had started. Yeah, it was definitely an email. Okay. But I remember re- responding right away. No, I don't you, think we texted yet. Yeah, but I remember re- responding because I have the visual still in my head of you sitting in your car in the parking lot and just feeling your anxiety. And, you know, but truly, I, I couldn't see why you were anxious because, you know, at that point, I knew how accomplished you were and what you knew. And so, you know, it was like, Oh, you're going to have no problem going in there. 
but I understand that. that That's that so funny because I, I mean, I can't say I did not feel confident. So yeah, like it was, you know, I just remember that so clearly. But that was mm-hmm. the summer yeah. too. Like so after that, well, actually, no. Remember, I sent you like all of this documentation. So at saying I met Linda Silverman, and um, then I ended up going to talk with her at the Gifted Development Center a few weeks later, and I had sent her this box with like 800 pages of my journal entries and other stuff, which she didn't read. And I sent it to you too, because I wanted you, I sent it to you also because I was like, well, you'll tell me if this is crazy. And I'm sure that it did seem crazy, but that was like my research process. You know, I mean, I, I was sharing this information about myself because I was looking for feedback. You know, I wanted people to be able to like, to look at what I was looking at and give me some kind of, um, yeah, I mean, just feedback information about what, what they were seeing from my words and what I was dealing with. Yes. That was clear to me. So when I, so yeah, so you remember, I remember that, but, um, what I do remember is that I never saw what you saw in yourself. I honestly saw, a an intelligent, accomplished, confident woman. So I never saw that in you, the, how you, you know, you felt that you, you know, the mental illness or crazy or, and I remember wanting to convey that to you. And I'm sure I told you that. I'm sure in the emails I told you Well, and you I appreciated that. You did. And, and I really appreciated it. And so I'm really glad that you said that because that's really important to note that you weren't seeing me the way that I saw myself. And it took me a while to realize that other people weren't seeing me the way that I saw myself. I mean, I would say that it took me more than a couple more years to really let that sink in. But the result of that conversation I had with Linda and was sharing that stuff with you was that I began to realize that I'd been misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. And so that summer, maybe only a month after saying, if even a month, I went off medication and decided to see if I really had bipolar disorder or not. And that was a very tough decision. And it was also something that I remember sharing with you. And again, like, it seems like kind of a heavy thing to put on somebody. (laughs) Like, that we were like new friends. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to stop taking medication and see if this is what's really going on with me. But I was, I mean, I had a doctor and it wasn't, I wasn't doing it on my own. I did stop taking it. And, you know, it did turn out to be a misdiagnosis. And it's just so interesting to me, like, what a critical part you played in my life at that point when I was kind of rethinking that huge thing about myself that I'd considered to be true. And just really a big part of my identity was being bipolar you know, for like 20 years of my life. And so that was a huge turning point in my life that summer of 2015 when I decided to go off that medication and see if that's what it really was. I remember. I felt sure that you were fine. Although, you know, I have zero background, zero experience, zero knowledge of, you know, any mental health, anything. But I just knew in my heart, which, you know goes for nothing. But um, it was scary for me too. It was scary, but I'm so glad <laughs> it, it was what we both thought. It was, not, it was a misdiagnosis. I remember that summer I had like a big whiteboard in my office and I was writing out like all of the, the terms of Dabrowski's theory and trying to kind of memorize them. And that's where I was at that point. Like I was just at the beginning of my Dabrowski journey, actually. Yeah, it really blows me away to think about how much has happened since that point, but that we're still friends too. Like you're such an important part of my journey. You're, I talked with you so much more than Jen, like even though Jen was just barely in my life at that point, you know, I wasn't writing to her like I was writing to you. And so, you know, you're like the friend that's been there since those early days. And so it's just cool to have you here on the podcast with us to to share about this. Celie, I wanted to ask you about something, like just listening to this story as it unfolds. There's two things, but the first one is talking about this concept of holding space for someone um, and providing them support 
when you don't know what it is that you need to do, because this is something that's come up a little bit <laughs> with me and Chris and, and the podcast, and particularly through for me through my website, I, I have no qualifications or background in anything. And I have every now and then people reaching out to me and it's clear that, you know, they're in a bad space or they're really hurting. Um, and then like that's when you do that whole oversharing thing because you're just like desperate for someone to talk to. Um, and I know what that's like, but you, when you're sitting on the other side of that fence, you're like, holy crap, what do I what do I tell this person? How do I help them? Because you want to give them something meaningful, but you know, you maybe don't have the confidence to do it. So what are your thoughts or your advice or your tips on if someone's out there and they get someone reaching out to them via email or through a social media space or you're even in person, like someone they know in the workplace or whatever, what's your advice about how to best handle that experience where someone just comes and goes bleh and throws all the stuff at you and you're not quite sure what to do about it? I come across that often not you know wasn't just with Chris but on my blog I get comments even to this day uh comments where somebody just tells me intimate details about their life as a gifted person and this happened to me and this and um I I always go back to the place where I was when I was dealing with get my own gifted sons and feeling like I was the only one in the world that you know we were almost like aliens and there's nobody else that understands what we're going through but i i reflect on that place where i was and you know i think okay what did i need at that point the first thing is just you know be a good listener you know of course when it's through comments or texts emails you know um you you're not necessarily a good listener but you know i read the their messages, their emails, you know, twice. And I make sure they know they're, they're seen and that I, you know, that I am responding. So at least I'm acknowledging that what they said is valid. Their feelings are valid. I am, you know, very cautious about giving advice because I know that can get a lot of us in trouble when we're not, uh, you know, legally allowed to give advice. So, um, I just make sure they're they're seen. I I you know reiterate things in their story, you know, saying I understand. And then I often just use my own examples like, you know, yeah, I was there. Yes, I you know, this happened to me. And 9 times out of 10, just the validation that there's somebody else that knows what I'm going through, that understands, they went through it. And that lets them know they're not the only ones and, and it gives them hope. So um, that's normally how I handle it. And then in the end, I let them know in so many words that I'm here for you. I think you're wonderful. So, you know, go out and be wonderful. And that's how I, you know, I've handled most of those. Thanks for that. That was a great answer. The other thing I want to ask you about, and you touched on someone not seeing themselves as others see them. Chris was saying, you know, in, in the story that you know, there's a disparity be, between how other people see you and how you see yourself. Um, and you just said about telling them that they're wonderful and that do you, do you find that gap is sometimes hard to, to close or hard for people to even get their head around and fathom? I'm sure. It is for many, but, you know, in the scope of the comments I get on my blog, I, you know, their comments and my replies never get that deep, but I see where what I see is different from how they see themselves. Um, Now with Chris, it was, you know, more emails and, you know, more um, communication. And, you know, at times it wanted to say, no, Chris, you're not that way. You're not, but you know, of course I can't and I couldn't, but, but there is a gap between what, you know, a lot of us feel about ourselves and what other people see in us. Yes. How to bridge that gap. I'm sure it's different from, for every person, depending on the discrepancy between 
who they believe they are and who we all believe they are. Yeah, you've had to deal with a lot of people reaching out over the years. You know, you must have a lot of practice with this by now. Oh my gosh. Well, and you were just saying this week that you're, I mean, you still are dealing with new people finding your blog. And so, yeah, that's, that's something I think is important is for you to tell us or tell the listeners, you know, about your blog and like what prompted you to start doing it, what that's been like. I mean, whatever you want to say about it, but it's important. Like when you do a blog about giftedness, I mean, it brings a lot of readers and attention because this is, there's like always a new batch of people coming to this. Like, so now that I have a parent group with, you know, with friends who also help as admins. But, you know, we have this group for parents of gifted and twice exceptional kids. And there's a constant, like steady stream of new members and parents who are coming into this community for the first time, trying to figure out what's going on with their children. And so when you have a blog, you know, for a lot of people, you were kind of their first contact. And so tell us a little bit about your blog and tell us, you know, what made you do it and you know, what that's been like? I, I first started, um, you know, I was just struggling with one of my gifted sons who clearly was extremely intelligent, but school was not a good fit for him, which as a former public school teacher went against everything I was taught. Gifted kids make straight A's. They, they're, you know, their academic achievement is is what identifies them as gifted. And this was not what was happening. So um, I first started a Facebook group. I was living in Huntsville, Alabama at the time. And I just woke up just like, okay, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm going to start this group. And, you know, like that saying goes, if you build it, they will come. So I named it North Alabama Parents of Gifted Children. And um, from there, it it joined with the uh, Alabama Association of Gifted Children, but um, it still didn't solve the problems I was having. So I started writing and um, I started a blog and I used a pen name and nobody knew I had this blog, not even my husband. And I was just writing, you know, essays out of just what was happening, the frustration, the, you know, the, the, the fear of what's going on. And, um, I think the biggest was, you know, no gifted kids don't always do well in school. So I had written and I had this blog probably for six or eight months. And I don't know how many articles I had written, how many posts I had made, but you know, every day I'd sign in and, you know, your, the blog would show you how many viewers you had. And it was always me, just one. And one day I signed in and there was like hundreds. And I, that's, that's like, Oh crap. You know, what is this? And it was, um, it was Jen Merrill that had linked one of my posts into one of hers. And that's when I realized what I was writing, you know, was important to others. It, 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 it gave others something so that then I had to first tell my husband what was going on because he didn't know I had a blog. And um, Jen was the one that exposed me and I was no longer, um, I had to do away with the pen name. And anyway, it, it went from there. And then it, it became, you know, where I saw that what I said helped others. It just, you know, just validating. And um, then I felt strongly about paying it forward because I was finally starting to feel better about our situation, understanding more about giftedness, uh, finding out that I was correct, that giftedness doesn't always mean straight A's. And uh, the more I wrote, the more viewers I had. I finally felt that I'm giving back to the gifted community what they gave to me in my time of need. But I do regret the name, Crushing Tall Poppies, But that really symbolizes how I felt when I started the blog, when I, I, you know, it was intended to be just for me, just to blow off steam. And, you know, nobody knew about it but me. So, you know, what am I going to name this blog? Crushing Tall Poppies. Those teachers that are just crushing these kids, you know, but now I wish it was a different name because it is kind of negative, but it is what it is. 
Well, and Jen is laughing at chaos. And so, I, you know, with both of you, it totally resonated her laughing at chaos and your crushing tall poppies both just felt like apt names for your blogs. And I mean, because it's so unfortunate that that's the case, that kids, I mean, that's exactly what happened to my child. He started elementary school and it was a devastating experience that took years for him to recover from. So yeah, I mean, this is, it's real, like the school trauma and, and just how hard it can be. And playing devil's advocate, maybe that's how people feel when they first find the site. That you know, either themselves or a kid was you know, a crushed tall poppy. So you know, it might be a bit negative, but hey, you know, tell it like, tell it like it is. Maybe people see that and go, "Yep, I feel that in my bones." Exactly. Also, Emma, this actually brings up the point. Like, so the tall poppy syndrome is, isn't it? Like, didn't that originate in like Australia or New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, it originated here. Hurrah! For, I keep forgetting that, you know, we actually invent sayings and words here, and they're weird, and they sometimes slip out and people look at me weirdly like, where did that come from? I'm like, oh, yeah, we haven't just absorbed everything from American and UK culture. But, yeah, tall poppy syndrome, um, traditionally an underdog culture here. So for anyone who doesn't know what tall poppy syndrome is, it's where if someone achieves too much success or gets too ahead of the game, you know, or sticks their neck too far above the rest of the the poppies that they get cut down. Um, and that's happened with, you know, a number of celebrities and, and stuff over here. So, it, you know, it is a real thing that, you know, if you're no longer the underdog, nobody's cheering for you any anymore. And if you get too successful, um, people will try and, quote, unquote, bring you back to earth, but normally in the most brutal fashion possible. And Emma, you said it right. And um, most- brutal fashion yeah. possible because to me that cutting down tall poppies wasn't strong enough and that's when I was like they don't cut them down they're crushing them yeah and it's it's ironic because that sort of behavior is sometimes oh it's good for you someone's got to bring you back down to earth someone's got to give you a you know, dose of reality but for the person who's you know done their best and and had some success um it's often quite brutal and i think that's there's because there's a perception that anyone who makes it um or who has some sort of extraordinary talent is by default going to end up narcissistic and full of themselves and the best thing that we can do is like you know <laughs> knock the wind out of them so ironically it's coming from a place of well we just want you to you know maintain your humbleness and, and be one of us, you know, don't leave us. So it's coming almost from that place, but you know, how it manifests is often pretty cruel. I like how you said that, Emma, they want them to be one of us. You know, they want everybody equal. And that is how it, you know, for gifted kids in school, that's how it often is because it's, you know, we want teachers want kids to make straight A's, but they don't want them to go beyond what's being taught in class, which and for gifted kids, that's often the case. They're one, two, three, four, five grade levels ahead of the class they're sitting in. So, you know, make straight A's, but that's enough. Stop there. Because they're probably afraid of what will happen if holy shit, what does that say about me as a teacher if the, the kid starts, you know, being smarter than than me? And and also, too, people have got this horrible fear of other, you know, anyone that's an outlier or is, you know, different or whatever. Like, don't be different. <laughs> we don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> you know, today it's a bit different because we sort of, there's a lot of talk about embracing diversity, but, you know, there's, there's still that paradox that there's that don't be different because we don't know how to deal with different. Right. Yeah, it's true. So one place that I wanted to go with this episode, Celia, is that as we've been friends for these years now, what is like seven years since that summer when I went to sing for the first time? Well, both of us, I mean, we've gotten to know a lot of people in this community and we've also seen uh, some of the problems, you know, in the gifted community, frankly. And one of them, I would say, is the huge disconnect between academics and parents, for instance. That's just one. Um, 
that's been really apparent to me. And I know it's it's been something that you've experienced too, where academics will, you know, argue like, well, there's no evidence for that. Or, you know, <laughs> like, you know, try to, it's kind of like a, an invalidation of parents and what they're going through with their children, the way that they can, you know, leave comments on blogs or um, articles or like like belittling parents sometimes on Twitter. This is a huge problem. Like the discourse and gifted education on social media can get mean in a heartbeat. And these people who, you know, are professors and, you know, maybe writing about this or talking about this in their work, uh, somehow forget like the human factor that, you know, parents are observing these words and it's just something that I've found really upsetting at times over the years that, you know, we've been friends and I know that you've, you've had it happen to you too. Yes. I would have to say that with my gifted kids, that it was, it was actually teachers that wreaked the most havoc simply because teachers are taught that giftedness is, you know, to identify a gifted child in your class is, you know, first of all, that they're going to be the ones making straight A's. And, you know, we were never taught about twice exceptional students. Unfortunately, parents are a problem for teachers and in and, and teacher education classes, they make no bones about it. You know, they're, you know, parents can do this, parents can do that. So when a parent has a, a child that they're saying, I think he's gifted, you know, and, you know, right. Just, just saying that even in my own mind, I can just see teachers that I taught with roll their eyes because yeah, everybody thinks their kid is gifted. There's a, a, a huge disconnect between the education system and what we know about giftedness, you know, in kids. It's really like a problem in the field in many ways is that, you know, teachers who, well, I mean, only a fraction of teachers actually get trained about giftedness, period. You know, I mean, they are aware that gifted children are a thing, of course, but that doesn't mean that they've had any special coursework around giftedness, you know, but even the teachers who do get taught about giftedness, they may still have a perspective that it's about achievement in the classroom and, and not a, an actual difference. You know, and when, when I say difference, I mean like a meaningful psychological difference in being gifted, which is actually not accepted truth in the gifted education field that, that there actually is such a thing as a gifted child. I know that that it must sound absurd to some people hearing this, but it's true. I mean, we could do a whole episode just on the problems in gifted education. <laughs> but what you said, like, I mean, I think that there's so much harm done every day from teachers who don't understand what it means to be gifted, who aren't at, they're not accurately seeing giftedness because they have stereotypes about what it means to be gifted. And, you know, the stereotypes can be really problematic. And I would say that the same thing is true for stereotypes about ADHD or autism. Like we have a lot of beliefs about what we think things should look like, but that doesn't mean they're true or accurate. Absolutely. And I can say that as a former public school teacher, I was taught about giftedness in my discipline class. And in that one hour lecture, the professor gave us 10 minutes on explaining what a gifted child is in your classroom. And I remember walking out of that class with a picture in my head of, you know, a gifted child, you know, well-behaved, you know, always with their hands up, knew all the answers and made good grades. And, and that's dangerous. It's dangerous for, you know, for our gifted kids. For one of my sons, there was one teacher I, I don't know why she was bitter towards the kids who were obviously gifted in her class, but I followed her on Twitter and evidently she didn't understand the publicness of Twitter, but she put out tweets such as um, something to the effect that, oh, I, I thought that gifted kids were mature and well-behaved. And I thought, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what you were probably taught in school. But she was also the one that told my son more than once, well, if you're so gifted, why aren't you making A's? That was 
that was just terribly destructive. Wow, it is. I mean, there just are so many misunderstandings about what it means to be gifted. It feels like an enormous, overwhelming problem for those of us who are in this community and can see it clearly. And yet, you know, it's like I said, I mean, there's just, there's no consensus on this among the people who are actually, you know, doing the research and are the academics. And so, yeah, it's hard to know how to bridge the gap between the experience of giftedness and the people who are tasked with doing the research about it and teaching about it. Because one of the things that honestly has been kind of horrifying for me to witness is knowing that some of the academics in this field are training teachers and just are just so wrong in their beliefs about giftedness and what it means. And I don't know, I guess we should probably switch topics. I don't want to go too far down this path, but I'm glad that we took it for a little bit because it's important to say these things. I mean, this is a real problem. It is. And I, I, that was one of my focuses with my blog. And in fact, the most popular post I've ever written that keeps being shared and reshared and reposted is uh, an article. And a, a, the title, if I remember right, was uh, A Gifted Child Checklist for Teachers. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. And I've seen parents come into the parent group repeatedly and ask kind of, how can we introduce our child to their new teacher? What can we, can we write them a letter? Like, you know, they, they want to know more about that, the teacher connection. I remember your checklist because like, it it totally makes sense to me that that would be such a popular post. Well, that was my attempt, help teachers understand as a, you know, as, as one being on both sides of the fence, a parent of a gifted child and a public school teacher who was never really taught what giftedness really is, that it's not an academic condition. It's a, it's a psychological, it's a, it's a lifelong, I don't even want to say condition, but it's just the way they're born. Those tools, like providing teachers with the tools of how to deal with children is probably helpful. And I'm going to throw a devil's advocate idea out there that particularly in high school, there's some teachers that maybe there for the subject that's being taught and not necessarily maybe their skill set isn't with managing children or actual education. Um, I I remember distinctly I had an English teacher who <laughs> just declared in class one day, this is like when I was in my final year of high school, and she just said, I don't like children. And I turned around being the smart mouth that I was, and went, well, why the hell did you become a teacher for? Like, what, what was the logic behind that career choice? But we we see that not even with just teachers, we see it with managers as well, people who end up being people leaders, not because they are good people leaders, but because they're good technicians or experts in the field that they're in. But then they've got to deal with the people in that context and maybe their skill sets a little bit lacking around it. So maybe that's kind of, I don't know, a gap with, you know, with teachers as well as with, you know, people leaders that arguably they're there to manage people, but their subject matter expertise lies elsewhere. Yeah, I think that's probably true. What we were saying about uh, the educational system and teachers um, and how they're misunderstanding gifted kids it leads into the the topic of bullying just like my son heard a teacher say well if you're so gifted why aren't you making a's that that's bullying that's you know that's bullying a child that is just 12 years old and it's it's damaging yeah i mean it's an unfortunate reality that for children you know, not only do they have to worry about other children bullying them, but, you know, they get it sometimes from teachers and adults as well. And it's terrible. I mean, that's another thing actually that brought us together, Celie, when we were first becoming friends is that, you know, my kid also had been like really badly bullied in early elementary school. And that was another part of his, of his trauma that he had to work through when he was you know, when we pulled him out of school. And so I don't think that I realized like his sensitivity, you know, I didn't realize it was so bad 
I would have pulled him out of school way earlier if I had realized like how devastating it was. But I just didn't. It's like for some of us, you know, I was like, oh, you know, it, it just didn't occur to me how badly it was harming him because I was looking through it through like my own warped lens of, well, I mean, I dealt with worse stuff like that when I was a kid. I mean, I think that that whole attitude is something that, you know, leads a lot of parents to to not recognize like how much their kids are suffering just because, you know, they have like preconceived notions about how things should look or whatever. And I think a lot of us parents have trouble with with finding that fine line between helping our kids be, you know, to be resilient and to, you know, let things roll off their back. And then, you know, sometimes we don't realize, you know, our kids may not tell us how bad some of the bullying is because that, you know, another thing in school is don't tattle, you know, unless somebody's bleeding, don't come tell me anything. So, you know, they, they feel like they have to be tough and just handle it. And, um, it is traumatic, uh, whether it's from, you know, classmates or teachers or neighborhood kids, whoever, but I definitely believe gifted kids are more of a target. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's so true that I, it is a fine line between, you know, wanting your child to be resilient and, to like find their way out of their struggles and, and, re- and recognizing that, you know, you have to protect them too. It's, it's such a fine line and it's so hard to know like when damage is actually being done sometimes, you know, especially if you have a kid who is good at masking, you know, and, and not acting like anything is really wrong until it's, it's bad. So yeah, I mean, it's, these things are tough to deal with. And bullying, I mean, we see that there's adult bullying, too. I mean, it's not even only for children. So, I mean, bullying is just a, I mean, just a problem, just a societal problem. I mean, I feel like when I was coming to the Dabrowski community, (laughs) I saw bullying, um, you know, in the Dabrowski group on Facebook. And, like, I just remember coming into that group and being like, wow, this is just so unacceptable, you know, the way that conversations were going. And, you you know, I think social media just makes it really easy for people to forget like that there's a human on the other side of the screen. I think that it's why I didn't participate on social media for a long time. Even now, I kind of struggle with it a little bit because I, um, I'm just really sensitive, you know, and I it's hard to be vulnerable and really share online. At least it is for me because, yeah, I don't know. I'm just sensitive. <laughs> so it took me forever to f- to find safe places or create safe places where I felt like I could be myself because I'm only going to be myself. I mean, it's not like I'm going to go online and pretend to be somebody else. But, you know, to share authentically is hard because it's so easy for somebody else to come along and just share their thoughts that, you know, sometimes are appropriate and sometimes aren't. From, you know, the moment I met you is I'm so thankful that you've been vulnerable. I'm so grateful that you've told us your story because it takes somebody to be vulnerable and open and honest and tell their story to help all of us who are too afraid, who are in the same boat, but too afraid to admit maybe even to ourselves that we're, you know, we have those problems or those issues or those same thoughts. And I've learned from you that being open and vulnerable is the best way to help other people. So I I just want to thank you for being open and vulnerable and telling us your story because we've all grown from reading about your story and hearing your story and just knowing you. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I feel the same way about you, Celie. Like, you shared so much of yourself and also were vulnerable with your work and your blog. I mean, it's not easy to do these things. And all three of us, I mean, Emma, you too. Like, you share so vulnerably in your videos and on your blog. And it's not easy to share these things. But I agree with you, Celie, that it's the way to help. And, you know, 
Emma, you you have realized this too. And all three of us at this point have had this experience of, you know, feeling like the fear of, you know, just trying to help other people by, by being honest. It's, it's so powerful. A lot of people have given me trouble over the years about like sharing so much about myself. Oh, like, aren't I afraid what other people are going to think? Or, you know, like I'm going to destroy my reputation or something by admitting to having like the past that I have. Well, I mean, I'm not afraid about any of those things because I mean, I just know that it helps that other people hear these things and they feel seen, they feel less alone. And I just know how important that is because that used to be me too. This is a two-sided coin though. And I think this comes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the podcast is that you know, Sheila was talking about listening and the importance of you know being there to mirror someone through listening to someone and saying, I have been there. And I think the sharing and the vulnerability and the listening go hand in hand. So when we listen and we allow space for people to give their perspective, um, whether or not that's with, you know, friends or on social media um, or even with you know, what we're talking about with parents and teachers and that dynamic, when we create that space by listening, it allows people to be vulnerable. And then when someone is vulnerable, that gives other people the courage to be vulnerable as well. And I see those two things that you know we've been talking about, whether it's to do with bullying or anything else, it's creating space for people to be vulnerable and then also being vulnerable yourself, which just fosters that cycle. So, so really it comes down to listening and vulnerability and whether or not you feel brave enough um, or, you know, secure enough or more confident enough or skilled enough to do one or the other both of those things help. Yeah, that's well said. I agree. I, I was just going to piggyback on what you said, Emma. It was Emma's thoughts on, you know, it is about being vulnerable and listening and holding space. And I find the majority of the people in the gifted community are that way. And I think that's how we pull each other through the muck of giftedness. Yes, that is how we pull ourselves or pull each other out of the muck. Totally. And that's why the groups on Facebook are so important. Groups for gifted adults, groups for parents of gifted and twice exceptional kids. You know, there are these spaces where you can find other people who get it. And I think that that's a huge deal. I know that I'm grateful to have found people. Well, I'm grateful to have found both of you. And gosh, silly, when I think about like how much has changed over these past seven years and I'm grateful that you have been around for this whole time. And, you know, we've had so many conversations on the phone and emails and just when I think about like the, you know, like getting to know people and, you know, like my time getting to know Michael and I would like just so many conversations we've had where I've really valued your, your advice and, you know, just your ability to listen and hold space for me. So thank you so much. And thanks for coming on the podcast now. I mean, I know it's kind of nerve wracking and, you know, a little scary maybe to be on the podcast with us, but we're so grateful. And, you know, I'm sure that our listeners are too. Well, I am very thankful that you invited me. And it's, I feel like it's been a very good conversation, um, a very deep conversation and a very enlightening one. And um, I'm just thankful to be here and to have had this conversation. And hopefully it'll help. It'll uh, help someone pull them from the muck of giftedness. While we're thanking, I'm just going to say yeah, th <laughs> thank you, Celie, for being here. It was um awesome conversation. Thank you, Chris, as well. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. And listeners. Thank you too. Thank you for joining us for another episode. The Positive Disintegration Podcast is funded by the Dabrowski Centre. If you like what you've heard, please consider donating through the link in the show notes. And if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify, give us a rating or leave a review. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email positivedisintegration.pod at gmail.com or find us on Twitter or Instagram. And until next time, 
keep walking the path to your authentic self.